brush with hypoxia, which lives on in my memory. And I thought that I could share it with you uh, because um, it's interesting to me and I hope it's interesting to you. So what is hypoxia? Most of us know that it's a deficiency in the amount of oxygen in the human body uh, reaching our organs and our lungs. A cause is high altitude flying, which most of us would appreciate. As it's been mentioned by Steve, uh, when he was talking about his hot air, <laughs> the oxygen is reduced in the atmosphere with altitude, and so is the pressure. And so we might look at a few numbers just to sort a few things out. And so in this regard, uh, as Steve said, at high school did you learn that the air that we breathe consists of 20.8% of oxygen. It falls off markedly with altitude and by 20,000 feet it's only 10%. So that's a 50% reduction from 20 to 10. Um, also, that's the one I'd like you to think about. And pressure in millibars, and uh, a lot of people here will understand 10, 13, 10, 13.2. And by the time we get up to 20,000 feet, it's well under half. So Steve was talking about a packet of Wheaties. I'm going to talk about a litre of milk. <coughs> if you've got a litre of milk, and then a cup alongside of it, that's the ratio of oxygen to a litre of air. So you've got a, in that milk container, there's one cup full of oxygen. If we go up to 20,000 feet, it halves to half a cup. And if we look at the pressure, which is less than half, we're down to an egg cup full. So I've really given you the run around to the kitchen. But what started off as a, a cup of oxygen going in every time you breathe in is now becoming uh, an egg cup or less. And that's insufficient for you to operate and uh, work effectively and efficiently. So hypoxia may result in a loss of concentration and confusion because the amount of oxygen getting to the brain is insufficient for normal operation. It can lead to a loss of consciousness. A chap that I have lunch with on a reasonably regular basis flew to Melbourne. He went to sleep on the aircraft and woke up in a hospital in Melbourne where he stayed for the next two days while they did tests on him. So he couldn't put up with the pressurisation in the aircraft. I don't think that happens to many people, but it certainly didn't treat him very nicely. In extreme cases, it can lead to damage of the organs, so damage to the brain, the heart, lungs, kidney. And a possible sign of hypoxia is a reddish, bluish colorization of extremities. So your fingertips and toes may end up changing colour to a deep reddish blue. And so a Boeing 747 and other types of aircraft are uh, pressurised to 8,000 feet. The 787 is pressurised to 6,000 feet. And that's the story I just told you about uh, the chap in the 737 going to Melbourne. <coughs> We had a problem in Western Australia uh, where an aircraft took off from Perth Airport for Leonora uh, with eight people on board. It climbed through its assigned altitude and carried on uh, across Australia. The people on board were obviously affected by hypoxia and uh, an aircraft, sorry, two aircraft at least were sent up to observe what was going on and on board there was eight people strapped in and <coughs> apparently asleep or unconscious. Media called this a ghost flight. A year before that, a bloke called Payne Stewart. Do you remember the bloke, the last oh, one that wore plus fours, gathered trousers with stockings below it? He was a flamboyant golfer. 
um, and a uh, very good one as well. But he and three of his confreres chartered a jet to fly to Dallas on autopilot, it climbed to its assigned altitude and carried on across America until it crashed in South Dakota. And so, in an unpressurized aircraft, you are required to use supplemental oxygen. There's a couple of photos of me wearing an oxygen mask in about 1962 or three or four or something like that. We, for high level photography at 20,000 feet, used Mike Mike Lima, a freighter, which could easily be converted to our needs. Mike Mike Foxtrot, which was a passenger aircraft, which could be converted to our needs. And after eight years of operation uh, with MMA, where they tendered each year with a price, and uh, in 1960 it was 60 pounds per hour to hire a DC-3, which is pretty cheap. Um, it went up to 62 pounds in the next year, and then Ad Astra put in a bid in the next year at 58 pounds an hour, and they got the contract. After spending a year here, they reckoned that they were remote from their management and their service facilities, so they decided to go home. The development in the northwest of iron, ore, and oil and gas and pastoral development uh, put MMA under pressure, and they announced that they weren't going to be tendering for our work anymore. And so we came down to Jandicon to see if there's anything here that would replace the DC-3. And Sewell Flying Services had a couple of Queen Airs and we thought we'd test those, or one of them. And uh, Sewells were keen to find out what our requirements were and we were keen to find out what Sewells could do. And so we arranged a comprehensive test where the aircraft would climbed to a height of 5,000, then 10, then 15, then 17 and a half, and finally 20,000 feet. Each of those test levels would involve a run, uh, equivalent to a photographic run of 10 minutes. And I was to record uh, the data at the start and termination of each of those, those runs. So I recorded the time, the outside air temperature, indicated airspeed, indicated altitude and engine settings. On board the aircraft were the pilot, the chief pilot of civil flying services. Alongside of him was me with a clipboard. And down the back was a person representing our camera operator. And since we didn't have our camera, magazines and film and other equipment on board, we added another person just for the weight. And so we took off with full fuel and a typical weight uh, of a photographic mission. Before we took off, we looked at the oxygen masks and I was shocked when I saw the toy-like representation of an oxygen mask. I uh, had second thoughts about it. But anyway, <coughs> on we went. We did the tests and at 10,000 feet, we put on our oxygen masks. Uh, and then climbed on up to 15,000 feet, etc. We went on up to 17,500 feet, and I noticed that things weren't running normally. I looked at the pilot, and he was fiddling. Instead of setting up RPM on two sticks, etc., he was touching this and touching that and adjusting and carrying on. And I thought, this is unusual because he's a top pilot. So I just happened to look at his earlobe and it was a deep red blue color. And I thought, ooh, hypoxia. So then I looked at his fingers and underneath his fingernails was the same color, deep reddish blue. And I thought, extremities, yes, this is a real problem, hypoxia. I looked at my fingernails, normal color. I thought, thank goodness for that. We could have been in real trouble. And then I looked in the back, and the person in the back seat was fast asleep, and the person second from the back was sitting there with his oxygen mask off, stretching the elastic in it, and looking at the elastic stretch in wonderment. 
he was off the air. <laughs> and I thought, well, give him a couple of bit more minutes and he's going to be unconscious. So I turned to the pilot and I said, we've got to get this away. Things aren't going too well. Our oxygen system's not working. He said, no, 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 we've got more work to do. And I said, no, no, we've got to get down to below 10,000 feet as quickly as possible. He said, no, no, let's finish this run. I said, no, not at all. And it was unlike me to talk to a pilot, a very respectable pilot, a highly respected pilot, like that, but I had to become a little bit forceful. And I was asking him to increase the rate of descent uh, to something like 3,000 feet a minute because at the rate he was going, it was going to take us 7, 10 or so minutes to get down to 10,000 feet. At the same time, I was looking at the controls and placarded speeds. I was looking at flaps, cow flaps, all sorts of things on board the aircraft, thinking that I might have to have a hand in the management of this aircraft fairly soon. I also <coughs> elected to do what I called deep breathing. And that was to take a breath about twice as much as normal. Remember we talked about the reduction in the volume of oxygen. So I was taking in more oxygen than the normal breath. And then I was squeezing my chest like so to force that oxygen into my system. And I was doing that every second breath and squeezing uh, for about three or four seconds. I can liken it to if you were trying to push a cupboard or a, a wardrobe, you might give it a few goes and if it's not working too well, you take a deep breath, put your shoulder into it, clench your chest and your muscles and give it a go. So it was something like that where I was putting pressure into my system. And I'm glad I did because I survived all right and so did everyone else. I thought to myself, had I agreed with the pilot to complete the 17,500 foot run and then climb up to 20,000 feet, we would have become a ghost flight and we would have just cruised off into the distance, running a few and that would have been the end of us. So that was my brush with hypoxia. Uh, we almost became a ghost flight. Thank you. <laughs>